I should sort of start by saying that my mother died of colon cancer in 1977, and by the time she was diagnosed, it was basically she didn't have much of an in, insides left at all. And what's interesting, I think, is that at that time, very little was known, certainly by me. I mean, I'd sort of looked around for books and advice and, 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 and stuff, and I really couldn't find anything. And a tremendous amount of change since those days. I mean, also, uh, we're thinking back to that time in terms of research. The tools we had then were very primitive and, and blunt, and I was studying something completely different. And then, but I was in the habit, and in fact, 77 was the first year I went to teach courses in, at the Marine Biology Lab in Woods Hole, and I learned a tremendous amount of cell biology there and got to meet a lot of important people and heard a lot of fantastic talks and gradually uh, became very interested in, in cell division and its control. One day I did a little experiment. Everybody else had gone off dancing and I was left alone in the lab. And um, I, was, I was curious, actually, it was, the reason I did the experiment, I've only recently reconstructed it. I was interested in, in virgin birth. Uh, because I'd read a book called Artificial Parthenogenesis and Fertilization by a man who'd been very famous, a guy called Jacques Loeb, who was a Rockefeller scientist. And for some reason, I was curious about whether the patterns of protein synthesis in parthenogenetically activated eggs were the same as or different from properly fertilized eggs. So I did an experiment to compare them, and it turned out that uh, I just noticed when I developed the results the next day that one of the proteins, which was one of the strongest proteins that these eggs were making after they were fertilized, disappeared just before the eggs divided. And I thought, wow, that's very extraordinary. <laughs> and then I ran into somebody, it was a, that was, the so experiment was done on a Thursday, on a Friday evening, I ran into somebody who I'd heard give a talk three years before about a mysterious substance called MPF, which is maturation promoting factor. And, um, and this guy was John Gerhardt, who was a very fine scientist, actually, a Berkeley professor. And um, so I went up to him at the wine and cheese party after the Friday night lecture. And he told me this electrifying fact, which I hadn't known before, which was that MPF when it came back the second time, needed new protein synthesis. Now that doesn't sound like terribly much, but I'd just seen a protein disappear before the cells divided. And the idea was very simple then, that you, in order to move forward, you had to get rid of what had brought you to that point. And then of course, because you got rid of it, you'd need to make it again for the next division. And then you'd get rid of it and, and it turned out, I mean, everybody thought I was completely crazy. Life couldn't possibly be that simple. And anyway, at that time, um, proteins couldn't disappear like that. Either everything disappeared like it does in your gut, or, you know, everything stays. Because how could you possibly single out one particular protein in the cell and get rid of it? It wasn't, it was imp impossible. So everybody said this was completely impossible and anyway life, you know, this couldn't possibly be the secret of cell division because everybody knew cell division was very complicated. But I, I kind of knew but from past experience that when a simple little fact explains everything so beautifully and naturally, it's usually the right answer. And so it, so it proved. Um, and so we had to find out what this protein was and that took Ooh, let's see, from 1982 to 1988, 1987 really, something like that, five, five years. And we had to invent a lot of new technology and stuff. And, and then we were very slow actually to figure out what was going on. Um, because I, I knew, I got to know Paul Nurse very well because we were both interested in the control of the cell cycle. But there seemed like there was, there was a gulf between us. He was a geneticist, I was a biochemist. I didn't understand what he was doing. He didn't understand what I was doing. You know, and, uh, it, it took us forever to realize that actually 
um, we were partners. I mean, so his protein and my protein actually form a, a really tight complex, and my protein turned his one on, and nobody had ever thought of that before. And so, you know, it was a wonderful moment when we suddenly the truth truth dawned. And then everybody said, oh, well, gosh, now you understand the control of cell divisions. This enzyme that makes, that catalyzes cell division. Fantastic. Um, so now you understand that, you can obviously cure cancer, because cancer is a disease of cells growing out of control. But Paul and I thought, well, hang on a mo. you know, I mean, we all know what happens when you block cell division. The, the people who survived or rather didn't survive Hiroshima tested to that you know you you just you you die in about a week if you block all cell division so there's really no evidence that cancer cells have anything wrong with the basic cell division machinery but then it, it, it turned out it was a bit more complicated than that and that the the example that we had stumbled on namely that a, a protein kinase, which is an enzyme that modifies other proteins by sticking phosphates onto them, um, which has an activating subunit, that this was quite a large family. It was such a good invention that nature had used it and reused it over and over again in different situations. So, and I think what we're going to hear this afternoon is that actually inhibitors of one class, not the one that we originally discovered, but a related ones, is showing great promise in the in the in the clinic and I'm very much forward looking forward to hearing what the seeing the whites of the data's eyes and, and, and seeing it.